Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Pastor Matt Wolf asked me to make a presentation for today on intelligent design, and frankly, I was a little bit puzzled, but uh, been one of my interests for for quite a while. And uh, I got this I got this time, so there will be time for questions at the end. And during the, during my presentation, if anybody looking for clarification or I'm not clear about something, uh, go ahead and speak up because we should have time. Um, so to get started, uh, it seems ironic to me that there's some sort of barrier uh, has built up between um, faith in God and the study of science. Uh, my interest in intelligent design has done a great deal to strengthen my concept of God and his amazing powers. To kind of save a little time, I'm going to refer to intelligent design as ID in my discussion of some of the elements uh, of the thinking that I'll present this morning. We serve a God who has intelligence and incomprehensibly complex powers that are beyond our ability to ever understand. Uh, this being said, I will not be discussing God or the Bible. Strictly speaking, ID is not a theological topic. It's been attacked primarily because it is compatible with Christian thought. The separation of intelligent design from any religion is critical in understanding the significance of ID thought as well as making it possible for ID to be accepted as a science. Um, ID is a relatively new branch of science Intelligent design is compatible with the Bible, but it's not based on the Bible. We have laws against murder and theft. You know, they're, they're, based, they're, they're compatible with, with what's in the Bible, but they're, we can make an argument that they're based on the Bible, but just as an example. In intelligent design references, you'll find no mention of God, Jesus, prayer, scripture, or religious beliefs of any kind. Nevertheless, Amazon places ID books under the genre religion. The designer is never identified in any ID publications. And interestingly, uh, ID proponents are not necessarily all Christians. Uh, we are discussing a scientific and mathematical way to evaluate how complex life is. And it seems to me that intelligent design can be used as a tool to convince agnostics and atheists that God does exist. In fact, one lifelong outspoken atheist named Anthony Flew published his belief in an intelligent designer and renounced his lifelong atheism as a result of reading in intelligent design. Uh, intelligent design also refutes Darwin's theory, which is generally accepted by society and contradicts what we find in Genesis. The identity of the designer is immediately clear to Christians, and in my opinion, again, it strengthens, strengthens faith. I have spoken to people who were raised in the church, but after public school education on Darwinism, rejected what had been taught in church. The father of intelligent design was a man named Philip Johnson. He was a law professor at Berkeley, California Law School. What do you know? Who would have guessed? He, can, he recognized flaws in Darwin's theory and saw evidence of design and life on Earth as well as in the universe. The ID movement started in the early 1980s with a gathering of like-minded experts in biology, mathematics, astronomy, physics, and other branches of science. A summary of the astronomic and physics aspects of intelligent design theory can be found in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Um, that's one of the books that's in the, the handout today. There's some references if you want to. I'll, I'll go over, I hope to go over them um, at the end. Um, but my focus will be on the biologic aspects of intelligent design. I might say this is due to time constraints, but really it's because the areas outside of biology are way above my pay grade. I am a biologist. More on that later. I recently heard an interview on NPR radio, a science program, with an astronomer who announced he had found an Earth-like planet 126 light years away. Hats off to him. This is roughly 750 trillion miles away. The interviewer then asked if he thought we would ever be able to visit the planet. 
Uh, I have a biology degree, Bachelor of Science in Biology. My focus in ID is on the world of living things. They are a lot handier and so much more convenient to study. Intelligent design contradicts the theory of the origin of life and evolution many of us were taught in high school biology. There are huge problems with Darwin's theory. Despite this, information which demonstrate these flaws are generally ignored or misrepresented by most in academia and the media, and apparently also on Amazon. Darwin had no idea of how life began, had had no knowledge of the complexity of life. We still have no agreed scientific explanation of how life began, but we have learned a great deal about how complex all forms of life are. When we see design, we should recognize it is the work of a designer. Prominent anti-ID authors have written, basically this is a quote, we constantly have to remind ourselves that the living things we study were not designed but evolved. Darwin himself actually acknowledged that living things appear to be designed. However, Darwin's theory removes the need for a designer. Uh, evidently, the anti-ID people, uh, their education and intellect is telling them that living things evolved, but their worldview rejects the fact that they may be wrong about evolution. Scientists have a tendency they share with many other people. They hate to admit they are wrong. And this is particularly true when they have devoted their entire lives to the study of how things evolved. We've come full circle in our public education system. The 1926 Scopes Monkey Trial was over a law which prohibited the theory, teaching the theory of evolution in the public school. Oops. Since that time, evolution has been taught not as a theory, but as fact. For many years, the New York State Department of Education has mandated teaching of classical Darwinism in our schools. A federal case in 2004 was brought by our friends in the ACLU against, you may note a little sarcasm in my presentation here, from time to time. So the ACLU brought a federal case, a case in federal court against the Pennsylvania School District which suggested if students were interested in alternatives to Darwinism, they read a book that was in the library. And it was found that intelligent design was religion in disguise, and therefore the book had to be removed. The judge had his photo on the cover of Time magazine for his brilliant judicial acumen. <laughs> the dictionary definition of evolution is confusing. Check your dictionary. The word evolution is used to describe progressive changes to living things over time due to random unguided forces resulting in new species and also to improve design over time guided by intelligence. We speak of the evolution creating new species and the evolution of the airplane using the same word. And watch for this in discussions of this topic. You know, are we, are we looking at, are we discussing change due to random accidents or by inhuman intelligence? Um, Bill Nye the Science Guy has been included in the list of top 100 scientists of our time. Bill, <clears throat> I am not making this up. Uh, he is also a staunch evolutionist. Bill Nye is a children's television entertainer. He has an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. Some of you may have watched the debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham at the Creation Museum a few years ago. Might as well have Mother Teresa debate Hitler about the value of human life. Uh, Nye repeatedly state, stated that science welcomes new ideas, and this is simply not true. To expand a bit on Dr. Ware's talk last week regarding changes in medical education, there is no such thing as settled science. If science is settled, the scientists are all out of a job. Science is always changing. However, it seems to me the new ideas in science are usually initially rejected simply because they conflict with current views. One example from the history of medicine involves a doctor named Ignaz Simmelweis. Um, Hungary, I think, I'm not sure. He wasn't in this country. Um, in 1847, he determined that doctors who washed their hands after doing autopsies before they treated healthy patients had much fewer infections. His idea was ridiculed Eventually, he was forcibly committed to an insane asylum where he was be beaten to death. These days, researchers with new ideas are simply fired or denied tenure. 
we don't beat them to death anymore. Uh, one important thing, in my opinion, to understand is the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. And if we look at the New York State Department of Education curriculum, it can, in my opinion, it confuses students by using bacterial resistance to antibiotics as an example of evolution. The bacteria have evolved the ability to survive treatment with antibiotics. This is microevolution, which certainly does occur. It's kind of a misnomer because we're, we're using the term evolution. Um, but ev microevolution is a change within the species which occurs to, ad occurs to adapt to a change in the environment. However, the bacteria are still the same species. There are no examples of one species of even the simplest forms of life, single-celled organisms, changing into a new species. A scientific study which began in 1988 has fostered over 73,000 generations of E. coli and exposed them to various environmental changes. Microevolution of the E. coli was observed when the environment was changed in various ways, but the E. coli are still the same species after 73, at least 73,000 generations. Despite years of effort, the bacteria remain the same species of bacteria. They do not evolve into new bacteria, novel, novel species. Another example of microevolution is what we humans have done to our best friend, the dog. I think the dog ought to find another friend. <laughs> Despite the incredible variety of dog breeds, all dogs belong to the same species. And um, in uh, the library I had at, at uh, my veterinary hospital, when I was in practice, there were three volumes devoted to discussions of um, inherited diseases that you would find in certain breeds of dogs. Um, and that's what happens when we micro-evolve our, our best friend, is that, that the dog, we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but the, dog, the dog's genome um, frequently comes up with you know, new things. Dogs with no hair, dogs with lots of wrinkles in their skin, dogs whose facial folds rub on their cornea, uh, dogs that, that are unable to give birth without caesarean sections, and these sort of, sort of inconvenient aspects of our, our new breed of dog. Uh, but they're all, they're all the same, uh, they're the same species. Macroevolution, which we don't really hear that term very often, but macroevolution is a change in a species which produces a new, different species, and there are absolutely no published examples of this occurring. Intelligent design has been variously branded as biblical creationism disguised as science, a failed science, and a pseudoscience. It seems to me this is simply because people automatically reject any information that has theological implications. ID has been rejected as a science because it is non-falsifiable. ID does not identify the designer. It shows, using science and math, that living things are too complex to not have been designed. If the designer is identified, it's labeled as religion. If the designer is not named, it's labeled as unscientific and religious. There is no scientific way to prove the designer doesn't exist. So that makes, by definition, that makes intelligent design not a science. Um, so anyway. Um, taking a look at the, the other choice we have, uh, Darwinism, it seems to me that Darwinism is not only falsifiable, but it has been proven to be false. Darwin wrote that the fossil record in the 1850s did not support his theory, but he predicted intermediate forms would be discovered. Paleontologist still admits the fossil record does not support Darwin, despite 150 years of hunting for fossils the fossil record still lacks intermediate forms. Also, there is no agreed explanation for what's called the Cambrian explosion, 20 groups of totally different forms of life suddenly appearing in the fossil record at all time with no in-between fossils. The fossil record of around 250,000 different species identified so far shows that new, new life forms appear and disappear rapidly with no intermediate forms, showing gradual changes. The origin of life is still a complete mystery to science, despite 150 years of attempts by naturalists to explain it. 
Proponents of Darwinism have recognized the faults in the theory and have created several ways to prop it up. These ideas strike me as quite imaginative but have identifiable flaws. One of those is neo-Darwinism. This uses DNA and genetics to determine how one species evolved into another. Proponents look for repeated DNA sequences in different species. Everybody got a pretty good idea what we're talking about with DNA? Uh, good. Uh, proponents look for repeated DNA sequences in different species to demonstrate common descent. If we look at the human genome, about 98% has an unknown or yet to be determined function. And originally, uh, this unknown, we didn't, we didn't know what this 98% this of our genome did, so it was labeled junk DNA. Yeah, um, talk about a world view. It's been determined that all DNA has functioned, although what it does is not well understood. 2% of the human genome is needed for the manufacture of 100,000 different proteins. And we'll get into how complex, even very simple proteins are in a little while. Scientists have yet to determine what much of the other 98% does. And if you search the internet for beneficial human mutations, you will find sickle cell mutation as an example of a beneficial mutation. We have doctors in this church who have had patients with this benefit who can s discuss the serious symptoms it causes. The sickle cell mutation is only beneficial in areas where malaria is a very big problem. Uh, punctuated equilibrium, which I didn't know about until I talked to Matt Eggleston. I wasn't familiar with that term. Um, but it's, I, it's part of the New York State curriculum, I believe. Um, Punctuated equilibrium has been advanced to explain the glaring problem of lack of fossil evidence. This theory states evolution occurred at a very rapid rate for very brief periods of time, <laughs> and therefore no fossils exist. <laughs> this theory throws Darwin under the bus since it ignores the basis for Darwinism, that gradual changes resulted in new species. There's no accepted mechanism for how these sudden radical changes in life could occur but it is used to explain the evidence of evidence in the fossil record. Furthermore, radical mutations of genetic information are always lethal. The changed individuals cannot survive. This theory also violates the second law of thermodynamics, which my wife said I should leave out of the discussion. <laughs> so I will. Panspermia is another one of my favorites uh, regarding the origin of life. Uh, this is a theory that proposes primitive life was introduced on our planet from outer space, either through material accidentally landing on Earth or perhaps by some very advanced species that planted it here a long time ago. I wonder why they haven't returned to see how things evolved. This theory simply pushes the origin of life to another location. It does not explain origin at all. And it takes a lot of faith to believe that life came to Earth from outer space. It's really cold out there, and there's also no air. The origin of life. Uh, Darwin thought that life originated by spontaneous generation in a warm little pond. In 18, and that's, I'm making that up. Uh, in the 1850s, there was no way to examine the details we can now see in all forms of life. The complexity of the cell demonstrates irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity points out that in order for any cell to function properly, all the different parts must be present at the same time. Even simple single-celled organisms are composed of thousands of tiny parts, which was all be present at one time for the cell to function. If a few parts are missing or defective, the cell dies. Darwin stated that if an organ could ever be shown not to come about by slow progressive changes, his theory would be proved wrong. Irreducible complexity shows that Darwin was wrong. There. And uh, the common mousetrap is used to illustrate the principle of irreducible complexity. All parts of the mousetrap have to be present in exactly the at the exactly the same time in exactly the same arrangement in order to make it work. And we're only talking seven parts. 
Um, one example of irreducible com complexity is in our body, in the blood clotting mechanism. Uh, many different components, over a dozen, must be present in our blood at all times to form a clot. If any of the clotting factors are lacking or defective, an injury causes continuous or prolonged bleeding. Got that? Irreducible complexity. Another intelligent design principle is specified complexity. All the parts must be the, the correct parts arranged in only one way. Proteins are made up of incredibly complex chains of smaller chemicals known as amino acids. 20% of our body consists of proteins. There are about 100 amino acids found in nature and only 20 are found in living things. Amino acids are found in right-handed and left-handed forms. They're mirror images of each other. DNA is composed of only right-handed amino acids. Proteins are made of only left-handed amino acids. DNA is necessary to assemble proteins, but proteins are required to assemble new DNA. It's a classic chicken and egg situation. And this is an illustration of a very simple human protein of only, only 150 amino acids. Uh, one of the very simplest uh, proteins in our, in our bodies. Um, and these are all left-handed amino acids. Which one? Which protein is that? Wrong slide. No. Which protein is that? Uh, it's a protein involving muscle contraction. Yeah. I didn't memorize all 100,000 different ones <laughs> that, that they've identified so far. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I believe it's involved in the calcium metabolism and muscle contraction. Um, so, if we start with the soup, I'll, I'll, let, I'll get you started with the soup of uh, only the, the 20 amino acids that are found in life, all left-handed, and you put it in a jar and just shake it up, see what happens if two of the amino acids uh, connect. Uh, there, there are 20 ways to combine the two amino acids that start out this protein. There's 8,000 ways to connect three of the amino acids and 160,000 ways to combine four. Um, and all 150, if you combine all 150 amino acids in the correct order to form just this one simple protein, there's 10 to the 195th power possible ways to combine 150 amino acids. It's a very big number. There's 10 to the 165th power atoms in the galaxy, and I don't know who figured that out, but um, I'm just repeating what I, what I read. A tiny error in the assembly will make a non-functional protein, and there are some proteins in our body which are composed of tens of thousands of amino acids arranged in a very specific manner. How could any protein fall together without some direction? And to kind of illustrate the specified complexity, and anybody who wants to try this at home, uh, they're more than welcome. I will uh, let you borrow my five-piece puzzle. Uh, on the, uh, the left-hand side is the specified complexity puzzle assembled. On the right side is my attempt number 476 to do this at home, putting the five pieces together and throwing them down and see what happens, okay? I'm just making that up. I didn't really, I didn't really do that, but. But we got, so we got five pieces that we need to have in a specific arrangement in order to complete the puzzle. Um, so this, in my mind, helps you get an idea of the, uh, the problems with specified complexity without a designer. Um, I'm sorry. Well, I got it on Amazon. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't use it in this talk, so they, they sold it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It actually comes with a little there's actually six pieces. There's a, there's a wooden piece of plywood that's carved out to kind of help you put it together. Uh, 
a group of brilliant and very well financed scientists have actually created a new single cell life form which is called Mycoplasma Laboratorium. This effort showed that life can be created in the lab and it's a new species. It took 200 man years of effort and 40 million dollars to produce this novel cell. All it does is reproduce itself. Also, in my opinion, they cheated by incorporating existing parts from other cells. <laughs> if it took this much effort to create one new single cell bacterium, how likely is it that at some point in the past this all became accepted, assembled without any guidance? And our last slide is a diagram of a very, one very, very, very small part of our, uh, our, our, our DNA, um, well, it's DNA, but the numbers on the left, um, our human genome contains 225,000 genes, 6 billion letters, 700,000 kilobytes of information. Um, one gram of DNA can store, we don't have a gram of DNA in our, our, uh, our cells, but uh, one gram of DNA can store 250 million gigabytes of data, and I, I hope I figured the calculation correctly. I'll have to talk to Mr. Morrison, but I, I calculated that's a, about a million and a half uh, of the information I, can, I got in my gigabytes in my phone. A lot of information. And then we're winding down here. The complexity of the human genome can be visualized by the fact that if all the information in one human cell's DNA was typed on a paper, you would have a stack as high as the Washington Monument. This human genome contains 25,000 genes, 6 billion letters, and 700,000 kilobytes of information. It takes a lot of faith to believe this all came together by accident. We have two choices. Either this came together by a whole series of very fortunate accidents or through the work of a designer. And my last slide. If everyone in this room was about this big, about the size of an olive, everybody in this room was that big at one point in their life in the past. All the instructions for the assembly to create baby you, baby John, baby Rich, baby Nancy, were all there. All the instructions for the assembly of you as an infant, all the instructions for future growth, repair, and reproduction were all in that little package at about 10 weeks of gestation. But 10 weeks earlier, a thousand of you would fit in that olive size package. Uh, that, would, that wouldn't show up on my slide, so I used, decided to go out 10 weeks. One tiny cell. And your sex was determined then, not at birth. I'm a biologist, so I feel qualified to make this determination. Your sex was not determined at birth, but a whole lot earlier at conception. Uh, it cannot be changed. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. And it's only 10 o'clock, 05. I got a little bit more and I can go over the handout. Talk about the Big Bang. Okay. Right. Oh, absolutely. But Nancy told me not to discuss it, so yeah. But, but you can discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, uh, as it apply, at least my understanding of the second law of third thermodynamics, derm yeah, say that fast three times. As it applies to living things, um, if you don't add energy in the form of nutrients uh, to any living thing, it, it dies and decomposes. So uh, nature deteriorates things um, when, um, when life ends. 
uh, without adding new energy, uh, life, life will not continue. Um, I think that's about right. Also, all, all of our food, all of our food sources come from living matter, uh, which is another way to demonstrate that uh, uh, that's, that's part of the design. Uh, we can't survive on inorganic chemicals. There's a few that are necessary uh, to, for life, but, but all of it, and if you think about it, all your food sources, you know, at some point were living animals or vegetables. Yes? Good. Yeah, I think that's another another principle that I think would be would apply to the second law of thermodynamics that things do not improve with time. They gra everything gradually uh, deteriorates and dies, and that life can't be maintained without adding essential nutrients. True. Yeah. That's. Very good point. Yeah, things that are not living deteriorates in time. You know, if you don't take care of your car, you end up with a mess. Um, it rusts, the tires decompose, break down. Yeah. Uh, we got two people, I'm sorry. Well, I think, seriously think a lot of it is, um, actually, if you go back to Darwinism, when Darwin published in 1859, his theory was rapidly accepted. And it seems to me that, that people latched onto it because they didn't like the idea of God. You know, if, if there is a God, then, uh-oh, you know, where did we come from? Why are we here? Uh, what's our purpose? Um, uh, they didn't like that idea. And uh, the uh, I think I think that's it. Just that that they 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 the scientists that that aren't interested in this idea uh, don't like it because of the theologic implications. Actually, that that kind of ties in with uh, a, a thing that, that as long as we got some time. The Big Bang Theory, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity has been accepted since it was published in 1916. Originally, Einstein was upset because he immediately recognized the theologic implications about of the origin of the universe, the theory of relativity, implied that there was a creator of not only, you know, life on Earth, but everything. Uh, we hear about the Big Bang creation, and this has been accepted by science and apparently proven to be correct. Again, way out of my, uh, way above my pay grade. The name Big Bang came from a scientist who was trying to make fun of the theory, but the name stuck. Big Bang makes us think of a giant explosion when time began and all the atoms of the universe were violently shot into space. It's been accepted before the Big Bang there was nothing. Science has accepted and apparently also proved the sudden origin of all matter and life, but no one has any idea of why or how this happened. The explosion created a precisely ordered universe. There are, going back to I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, there are 122 physical values which have been determined to be exactly where they are, exactly where they, are, they need to be to make the existence of life on Earth possible. Explosions don't create order. Explosions destroy order. And it would seem that this is a very unusual sort of explosion. The precision of the universe strongly suggests the designer. And Einstein originally, when he published in 1916, he really goofed. Uh, and apparently he made a very simple algebraic error. Again, way above my pay grade, he divided by zero. And yeah. Three years later, a Russian physicist said, said hey, you know, Albert, you, you kind of messed up there. Um, and uh, so, so right away, Einstein, apparently, a uh, brilliant scientist, uh, but he, uh, he didn't like the idea that his theory would, would point to a designer. 
And, you know, we're still, we are, you know, 100 plus years later, and we're still trying to deny there's a designer. Thane, you had a question? No, I was just going to talk to the other non scientists in here. I'm not kin to the monkey. The monkey's not kin to me. I don't know much about your ancestry, but mine didn't swing from a tree. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And it's a song. I could sing it if you like. Yeah. Uh, actually, that reminds me, uh, Chris V. Strand, who, who she and Al moved to, to uh, Florida quite a while back, but uh, remember a conversation with her because her daughter came home from not the current biology teacher. This was quite a while back, and uh, she was the daughter was quite upset because the biology teacher had descend, said that uh, we had descended from apes, and. Uh, Chris Vistrand said, well, you go back to that biology teacher and maybe tell him that maybe his ancestors are apes, but yours were not. So <laughs> another, uh, another thing. And uh, if we get, you know, kind of get into the weeds here, but apparently uh, the difference between my genome and anybody else's is one-tenth of one percent. So one-tenth of our genome produces the incredible variety of, of human beings. Uh, try to wrap your head around that one. And uh, we sh apparently share 98% of our genome with a chimpanzee. So what? You know, big deal. That biology teacher came to faith in Christ. Uh -huh. Later. Bill Kelly? No, different, different biology teacher. Yeah, right. Yeah, this was quite a while back. Sorry. Yes. Uh, in terms of design scientists who are not Christians, what do they say about um, where the intelligence and the design came from? They just leave that as a tension that they can't answer, but they can't also deny the fact that there appears to be intelligence and there appears to be design. They don't have to reconcile a God to that. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how you can say you're an intelligent design advocate. You see it and you use the word intelligent design and not conclude that there is a designer with intelligence and who else is that going to be but God? Right. You just say, well, I'm just not going to go there. But at least they're on the way there. Right. The door, they crack the door open. There's yeah. Right. No, I, 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 think, I think you have a really good point, and uh, uh, that's, you know, we're getting into arguments with uh, Amazon about whether this is a re religion or not. It's, and that's why, in my mind at least, it's very important to say, yes, this is compatible with the Bible, but it's not based on the Bible. It's pure science. It's based on mathematics and observation of, of living things. Um, but the identity, again, if, if, if an intelligent design author says, you know, just like in Genesis, this all happened, uh, it's, you're going to be labeled religion, you know, right off the bat. So. What would be some of the scientific criticisms labeled against intelligent design today by scientists who reject that theory? What would they, how would they that's, that's a really good question. Um, I got a book. Uh, a while back, started to get into it. Oh, uh, actually, that brings up um, one of the things. Uh, there's references in the handout. There's a, a few questions for the biology teacher, uh, Matt Eggleston. Watch out. Um, and uh, one uh, one book that Bill Perrine uh, recommended. It's uh, creation, evolution, and intelligent design. Uh, it's kind of a synopsis of uh, actually four different views uh, of uh, what we're talking about, kind of ties in with, with the previous talks. And they also have a chapter on what's called theistic evolution, which is a, apparently a Roman Catholic view. And uh, I think Crick is uh, one of the discoverers of DNA, and he, he is, he is uh, 
a theistic evolutionist, if you go to BioLogos, if you want to check that out, um, that they, the, apparently the theistic evolutionists believe that there is such a thing as evolution, but God used it as a tool to create life. Um, I, there's, there's so much in there, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't get to all of it. But um, Behe is um, uh, one of the prominent authors in intelligent design. And if you, if you Google him and go to Wikipedia, you'll find out he's at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. And, and whoever wrote the biography uh, said, you know, we'd really like to get rid of this guy because we don't like what he's talking about, but <laughs> we can't because he's got, he's got uh, tenure. Uh, and he's a, uh, he's a prominent intelligent design teacher uh, in a college in Pennsylvania. Um, the four authors present their cases for uh, biblical creation, for evolution, uh, and, uh, and intelligent design. And then the other three authors critique the essays. It's really kind of a neat, a neat little book if you want to get an introduction into this thinking. Um, and uh, our daughter-in-law, uh, Lincoln's, Lincoln's wife, Julie, recommended a book called Have You Considered? Uh, by Von Vett, and this is a daily devotional. My wife and I have really uh, enjoyed reading that. It's just really short daily, you know, 10 paragraphs of information uh, which is compatible with younger theory and geology, biology, and uh, a lot of neat stuff in there. And uh, the other, um, It's available on, on audio and, and also in print. Also, The Body, A Guide for Occupants. And uh, on Audible, Bill Bryson is the author, and he's, he, reads the, he reads his work. He's a staunch evolutionist, but when he goes through all of the amazing parts of, of our body, I don't understand how he can say it all came together by accident. I mean, he, he goes into extreme detail about... Uh, the skin, you know, all the, all the different organs. Um, but I, I just think it's a world view, you know, if you were, and I was brought up that way. Um, um, we didn't discuss evolution at home, but I, I took biology in, in high school. And uh, our textbook said that basically uh, chapter one, sentence one, you know, life originated on a little beach a long time ago from inorganic chemicals. And, and then we got into evolution and it was actually a conversation I had with, with uh, Dr. Dr. Kim, Tim Gorman. He doesn't remember it, but I sure do. And uh, we're talking out at the office one day, and I made some reference to evolution. And he said, I don't believe in evolution. And I said, hmm, really? That's interesting. <laughs> How'd you get through medical school without believing in evolution? Uh, and then after that point, uh, I, I can't recall exactly when my interest in intelligent design came along. but. Uh, it certainly throws Darwin under the bus, in my opinion. But as far as why it's not accepted, in my opinion, it's just because people don't like, it's so contradictory to so much of our, what's, what our society believes that they, they don't like it. They don't like the idea.
as we go along. Diseases and things that break down and break cause suffering and death and disease. And so I just don't know, there's no living evidence of things getting better right. ever discovered. That's right. And how they so staunchly insist that we are evolving as better when all the evidence is we that are. we keep evolving into worse right. as time goes by. Right. Almost all mutations in any species are either irrelevant uh, and or uh, or lethal. Uh, most radical mutations are lethal. The the mutated species individual does not survive, and these so-called beneficial mutations are. It seems to me are only. Uh, adaptive changes to the environment. The sickle cell is, is an example I use. Um, my understanding of sickle cell anemia, sickle cell genetic change of the red blood cell and allows the individual to survive longer in uh, an area where there's, uh, where there's a, a lot of problem with, uh, with malaria. That's all it does. It's only beneficial in, that, in those ge geologic areas where there's a lot of Malaria, and if you take that individual and remove the malaria, they they're, they're very ill. It's not beneficial. It's a it's 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 an adaptive change. It's microevolution. You, you had a question there, the young lady in the in the yeah, blue dress. I, I wondered, um, and I wondered a long time, supposing we do have some sort of uh, evolution that we can look back Right. Right. Got to wait a long time for the girls to evolve, don't we? <laughs> That's actually one of the questions for the biology teacher: How do male and female forms of life evolve? How do organ systems evolve? What's the selective advantage of our being required to remain unconscious for uh, one third of the time we're on Earth? You know. What's the advantage of that? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, again, there's so many we don't know answer, uh, answers to these questions. If you watch any show nowadays, like on PBS or uh, Discovery Channel or whatever, the idea of evolution is just promulgated continuously. Here I am on the show last year, it's on hummingbirds, and there's this particular hummingbird that has this long curved beak, which allows it to get yep. connected on it's some flower that's also long, and it exists at a certain elevation in the mountains in some particular country. Yeah. And they talk about how the hummingbird evolved that long, and so you get in there and get connected out of that flower. And I'm thinking, well, all the generations of those four hummingbirds couldn't get that nectar, and that flower, which couldn't have a hummingbird to fertilize that, right. how did they go on living until they finally figured out how to get to each other? Right. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, it's assumed that the 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 Bill Bryson book that, that Nancy and I are listening to on Audible does that. It's just, it's just assumed. And if you, if you Google evolution of male and female, you, what you get is a definition that starts with the existence of male and female. You know, how they came to be is not addressed. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a worldview and it's become ingrained in our society and in our education system. And thanks to the ACLU, the kids in the Pennsylvania school aren't allowed to read the book. Here you go. Trim 30. Um, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or ditties they'd like to sing for us? or? Okay, well, this really, uh, again, uh, just to really conclude, um, 
my study of uh, intelligent design has, has really reinforced my, my belief in a God. Uh, and, and how can we understand an intelligence that is able to put this together? It's incomprehensible. It's just incomprehensible. But uh, like I said, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, thank you all.